God, would you be present here with us this morning? We love you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning again, everyone. Just recently, I was traveling south on 85, going from Elmira to Waterloo. I was with my wife. We were going to watch a movie. And as we were traveling along, uh, we were talking, and I noticed in my rearview mirror that there was uh, some lights from a vehicle um, right on my tail. And uh, as my wife was talking, I thought to myself, really? I drove a little further uh, along, and sure enough, back of my bumper, there were those lights in that truck, and I'm like, really? And uh, no one has ever accused me of being a slow driver. So I was in the lane, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, it's dark out. It's slippery out. I'm going just about 100. And I thought to myself, hey, pal, I'm not going over 100 for you. Next thing I know, on a solid line, on a winter's night, on a slippery road with cars coming at us, he pulls out beside me and passes me. I, of course, broke out in song to God, worshiping, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. <laughs> I decided to honk my horn, flash my lights. He wasn't going very far because there were cars in front of him. And I thought to myself, this is a safety issue. Somebody needs to do something with this guy. So I caught up to him and I honked my horn and flashed my lights. Highway 85, if you know it, goes from one lane into a, a, double, a, sing, a double lane, and, and uh, so he went in the fast lane, just kind of getting by those other cars, and I was on him, and one more time, I honked my horn and flashed my lights. And the whole time, my wife and I were carrying on a conversation. <laughs> we had the... Well, maybe his wife, you know, the water broke and they're on their way to the hospital <laughs> conversation. And I said, there is nobody in the passenger seat. <laughs> we had the, you're not a police officer conversation. And I responded, they should give me some honorary degree authority <laughs> that I can make citizens arrests because this guy something needs to be done with him. And by the way, if you have a black pickup truck and you want to come forward <laughs> right now. And then, of course, your Christian conversation. And I couldn't do much with that one, of course. On the way home from the movie, I turned to my wife and I said, um, I just want you to know, Lisa, that um, I'm making a promise to you that I will never act like that again. If I start to do, to do that, you have permission to tell me to stop, and I will stop. And the reason I made that promise was not because I felt like it. I told her, uh, we need to get our horn fixed because it wasn't loud, and <laughs> he really didn't get what was coming to him, and I still wanted to find this guy. I didn't feel like making that decision, but I am a Christian, and I've learned that I don't walk according to my feelings. I'll, I'll walk according to the Word of God, and whenever I walk according to the Word of God, God's favor is on me. You never lose when you honor God. We not only have the opportunity to encounter conflict on the roads, but we have opportunity to encounter conflicts in our homes, in our schools in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our community. Conflict is unavoidable because we live in a fallen world. 
Next week, we're going to talk about letting go, this idea of letting things go, very important. But today, we're talking about tackling conflict. And it's imperative that you learn how to resolve conflict, how to work towards strained and broken uh, relationships being reconciled. Because if you don't, you're going to be unhappy a lot because you're going to have a lot of conflict in your life. In fact, with unresolved conflict, we block our fellowship with God. We, it, it blocks our prayers. It hinders our prayers. And it really blocks our happiness. So I want to ask you, as we begin this morning talking about conflict, what's your response to conflict? Are you the person that attacks? Someone does something to you, and you honk on the horn, and you flash your lights, whether it's in the home or at school? Or are you the person that is passive? You're always looking for an escape. You never, ever say anything. Everything's swept under the rug, or you pretend it like conflict doesn't exist, or you don't want to do anything to rock the boat. Neither of those two responses is biblical. Today, if you're not there, you need to learn to make peace, to be a peacemaker. Look what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. He says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. God's favor, you are blessed when you are working towards peace. And that actually is a mark or an evidence that you really are a child of God. So we're going to look at five steps for us to take this morning that we can take uh, when we encounter conflict. And may God speak to each of you today. By the way, if you're here today and you're in conflict, okay, you need to act on this this week. If you're not in conflict right now, just wait a little while, then you can use this. But, uh, and if you're older, that you would seek to pass along these truths um, to those God brings around you, especially the younger generation, so that they can respond to conflict the way God wants. So number one, bring God into the conflict. As long as you keep God at a hand's distance, an arm's distance from the conflict, you know, I'll go to church and I'll, you know, do this or serve here, but I just don't want God involved because this is between me and the other person. Well, actually, it's not. And as long as you don't um, get God involved, you're operating in your own strength with your own resources, and you're going to fall up short, and you're going to be stuck in that conflict. But when you invite God into it, you're tapping into God's power, God's resources. Look at what 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says. We read, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. This is written to Christians who are in church and there's conflict going on. Should we eat this? Should we not eat this? And he says, listen, the bottom line is whatever you do, make sure you're doing it to the glory of God, that you're pleasing God, you're honoring God. Glory again means weight, that you're giving weight to God. You're, you're bringing attention to how big God is and how good he is. You're showing off God. It's like, why are you acting like this? Because God is great. And God is good. You're living for his glory. We need to see conflict as an opportunity to bring God glory. Are you looking at your conflict that way? That every time I want to bring God into it, but every time I want to see it as an opportunity to honor him, to please him, to grow, and to make me more like I should be. Just a reminder, if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, you don't belong to yourself. You belong to God. You were bought with a, a price, the precious blood of Christ. And you're now called to be an agent of reconciliation. You're called to work for peace. If you're married this morning, um, there's a lot of opportunity for you to bring God glory in your marriage, right? Because there's lots of opportunities for conflict. One particular author in her book list 12 different fights that we can have in our marriages. And let me just quickly run through them, and some of you would say, well, I, I can add a few more. That's great. Uh, first one, the partner improvement fight, the proving your point fight, the nagging tuning out fight, the escalating fight, the household responsibilities fight, the birthday fight. I'm not familiar with that one, but the birthday fight. The bad reputation fight, the you don't care about me fight, the parenting differences fight, the money fight, the sex fight, 
the difficult relatives fight. If you have children, there's lots of opportunities for conflict, lots of opportunities to bring God's God glory. If you're single, and you might be thinking, whew, I get the free pass. If you're single, God says to you, it is not good for you to be alone, that you need to be in close relationships. You need to be in community. And when you take that step and you put yourself out there, you're not isolated, you too will have opportunities for conflict because as we heard in week two, we're all different. There's all kinds of conflict that can happen. If there's unresolved, if there's unresolved conflict right now in your life, you have to ask the question, what am I really living for? Am I living for God's glory or am I living for myself? And you can stay for decades stuck with unresolved conflict because the reality is you're living for yourself. If you're going to bring God glory and bring him into the situation, it's going to mean, okay, I'm dying to myself. This is an opportunity to trust and obey God. So what's the second step? Take the initiative to address the conflict. You make the first move. Our tendency is to wait on the other person to make the first move because we all know the other person's to blame and we're not, right? I'm just waiting. You know, once they call, once they make contact, then okay, I'll talk. That's not what we're called to do and how we're to respond as Christians. Romans 12, 18, we read, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, God realizes there are some relationships where there is no reconciliation because one person doesn't want to make peace or one person is toxic. He gets that. But he's asking you to do your part. Leave no stone unturned that you're going and say, listen, I want to make this work. But if it doesn't work, Again, he understands that. Jesus taught the same thing uh, in Matthew 5 and 18. He says, if you've done something wrong, or you think you've done something wrong to someone, you've said something you shouldn't have, or you did something um, to them, you need to stop your worshiping, stop singing, stop going to church and, and be engaged like that, and you need to go to that person, and you need to try to make things right. And then in Matthew 18, it says, if you have been hurt... You don't just sulk and stay there, that you need to go to the other person and make it right. And often it's a case of both, that, that, but we're to be going towards one another. Now, sometimes it means bringing another person along. Sometimes it means um, um, seeking out um, a couple uh, to mentor you in marriage or, or uh, some counselor. Uh, there may be a third party involved, but it's the heart's posture where, like, okay, I need to do some. I need to take a step. And we can agree here, you know, okay, that's God's word. I should do it as far as it depends on me. But the problem or the challenge is, is that we've got this thing called fear. And it scares us to death to go to the person. Because when we do that, we're making ourselves vulnerable. What if this goes sideways? What if the person takes what I says and twists it and uses it against me? What if the person just outright rejects me and we have this fear? And in the Christian life, you have to understand, you have to push through fear again and again. And the question is, what is it that helps us, uh, helps us to push through fear? It's God's love. 1 John 4, 18, a very familiar passage. We read this, perfect love drives out fear. And John is saying in our relationship with God and with each other, they're connected. I can't love God and not love people. But he's saying, when I understand God's love and it's perfect, it's complete, it's expressed in my life, not only do I have a confidence towards him, but I have a confidence towards other people. In other words, for fear, uh, to work through fear, you've got to get full of God's love. You've got to remind yourself of his love for you. Jesus did a lot of great things in life, right? He, he helped people, but his greatest demonstration of his love for you was not in his life. It was in his death on the cross. And the more you can embrace that truth and you're filled with Jesus and his love, the more you are able to push through that fear. And uh, I, I, I confess, it's hard, sometimes scared to death. But I've taken that step, and you can too, to initiate a meeting. It's one thing to know 
the right thing to do. It's another thing to do it. And to do it, we need God's power, his love. Ken Sandy in his book, The Peacemaker, uh, a wonderful book. It's on our book list if you want to go on our website to, 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 to find more information about it. But he says this, peacemakers are people who breathe grace. Do you know people that breathe grace? Just, man, I don't know, but you, I just love to be around them. People, peacemakers are people who breathe grace. They draw continually on the goodness and power of Jesus Christ, and then they bring his love, mercy, forgiveness, strength, and wisdom to the conflicts of daily life. God delights to breathe his grace through peacemakers and use them to dissipate anger, improve understanding, promote justice, and encourage repentance and reconciliation. To, 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 to go forward with taking the initiative to set up this meeting, you need to draw continually on God's power, on his love, and on his grace and move towards the meeting. Now, I want to mention, too, uh, when it comes to a place and a time for the meeting, you never, or we're not to do it when we're exhausted and in a state of utter frustration. If you're married here, don't talk about issues late at night when you're uh, emotionally depleted. That's not the best time. You need to find a, 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 the right place and the right time. But, but when we do um, get to the right place, we figure out a time we can meet, what's the next step? The third step, confess your part in the conflict. When I begin, I don't begin with what the other person has done wrong. I don't begin with a bunch of accusations or with ways that I've been hurt. I begin with what I've done wrong. And maybe you're here and you're saying, well, you know what? I've done nothing wrong. There is the odd case where a conflict is 100% someone's fault and 0% our fault. But most cases, it's a mix of two people. The other person may be 80% at fault, and you're 20%. Or maybe you're 80%, and the other person is 20%. Regardless, you're to own your part. You're to confess what you've said or you've done wrong. Look what James says in James 4, uh, verse 1. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? So what causes conflicts? Don't they come from your immature spouse or your immature neighbor or friend. No, they come from your desires that battle within you. We need to understand that conflict happens when I want what I want and you want what you want and I have my needs and you have my needs and we bump up against each other. And so the call is to look at your heart. What are your needs? What's going on in your heart? And if you've done something wrong, then you're to own up to that. You're to confess that. And sometimes those needs are legitimate needs. They're God-given needs. But what can so often happen, particularly in a marriage, but even in a friendship, is that that need is not met and it begins to consume us. It's almost like idolatry. It's like, I'm not going to respond to you in any loving way until you meet this need. And this person, I'm not responding to you until you meet this needs. And they're just preoccupied with those needs needs or with uh, a particular need. So James says, you've got to take your part, own it. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to what he says, and why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will be able to see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Now, when we read that in the English translation, English language, we're not rolling over laughing. Jesus spoke primarily Aramaic, a little Hebrew and a little Greek at times. Well, he spoke Hebrew and Greek, but primarily Aramaic. And when he said this in the Sermon on the Mount, they would have been rolling over, bending over, laughing. Jesus had a sense of humor. And he often used it to challenge people. And so what he's saying is, listen, if you've got a telephone in your a pole in your eye, how can you go around helping the person with a speck in there? Like, bang, bang, bang. And they're just like dying, right? They're just, you should be on comedy club, Jesus. This is great, you know. But the point he was trying to make is, it's not like you've got a bigger part than them, but the thing is, why don't you start with yourself first? You deal with what you need to deal with. Then you'll be able to address what the other person's responsible for. You'll be in a position 
to do that. So if you're here this morning and you know your part, that's great. If you don't, would you begin praying, Lord, what's my contribution part to this conflict? Like, what is it, Lord? And you begin to pray that prayer. And once you have that at this meeting, you then begin with your part. It's where you say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? We have to guard ourselves against what we call token apologies, where, uh, let me give you a couple examples. If what I said upset you, I'm sorry. Okay, that's not a genuine apology. If what I said, like, I'm not sure if I did anything wrong or said anything wrong. Like, I just want to get you off my back. So if I said anything, okay, how many of you said that one? Okay, everybody should be standing, right? <laughs> Raising their hand. Okay. No ifs. That's an evasive apology. And no buts. I know I shouldn't have raised my voice, but you did this. But I'm tired. Those are evasive apologies, not genuine. A, a genuine apology is where you have this repentance, this idea that, you know what? I've done something wrong, God, and I want to honor you. So you're specific, and you acknowledge the hurt, and you ask the person to forgive you. I'm sorry I labeled you as this. It was wrong. I hurt you. Will you forgive me? And there's not a lot of forgiveness being asked in our culture. I should, it's, it's sometimes rare because it takes a strong person to own an apology and ask for forgiveness. And most of us aren't strong enough. But if we tap into God and his resources, if we're doing it for his glory, that's where we get the power and we can say and confess our part of the conflict. So we set up the meeting. We start with our part, our fault. Then, step four, we listen for their hurt and perspective of the conflict. James 1.19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are James' brother or James' sister. You're in the family of God. And notice he says everyone, so you're not excused. All of us have to learn the skill of being quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. If we don't lose the, learn this skill, what happens is we're always quick to become angry. But we have to learn the skill of actually seeking first to understand, then to be understood. I want to really hear you. I'm upset and we've got all this going on, but I really want to hear what you're saying. I want to better understand this. And uh, for those of you that are newly married or uh, you're early in or you're thinking of getting married, uh, I, I want to encourage you to learn this skill. I wished I knew it when I was younger because when I was first married, uh, I was defensive, right? And I would interrupt my wife, like she'd be telling me something. But of course, in my mind, I had to correct her, right? So I never learned to really listen well because I was defensive. It takes a strong person to not be defensive. And if I'm going to be strong, I need to be doing it in the Lord's power. So, Lord, this is not about me, ultimately. This is about you, your glory, your honor. So you just listen, and you're trying to understand. And all the while, the other person is feeling heard. The more that you can understand that person as you listen, the more patient you'll become, the slower to anger you will become. Fifth step, keep the goal of reconciliation before you as you work through the conflict. Your focus is on reestablishing the relationship, on um, reconciling the relationship. Now, again, that may not be possible if the other person is toxic or uh, is, there's this abuse or ongoing infidelity, things like that. If the other person is repentant, uh, uh, is not repentant, uh, you can't reconcile. But in most cases, when you have two people, they can focus and reestablish the relationship. Jesus said, or uh, Paul said this in Philippians 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, 
not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Take your focus off yourself and the issues and put your focus on the other person. You switch your focus. You're looking to the other person's needs and desires. Conflict resolution begins when we learn to do that, when we practice that skill. Again, what is the other person's needs? And sometimes it means, as you're listening, doing some extra homework. If you're struggling, and I just want to focus for a moment on those of you that are married, if you're struggling in your marriage with maybe it's money or sex or being on the same page when it comes to raising children, okay, you have to do some homework because you've got to better understand where the other person is coming from because the other person is different. So that might mean listening to a Christian podcast or reading some Christian books and like, okay, I'm seeing it this way, but what's their perspective? How are they seeing it? And as you focus on the other person, then you're able then to put yourself in a position where the relationship can be reestablished. I want to pause for a moment again and just talk for, about marriage for a moment. Last couple of decades, one of the kind of the top reasons for divorce in our culture has been incompatibility. And um, I just want to this morning remind us all, we're all incompatible. We're all different. So yes, you two are incompatible, but that's not the primary issue. The primary issue is immaturity. It's inflexibility. Because if this person's got a, a Christian and has the Holy Spirit, and this person is a Christian and has the Holy Spirit. It's a matter of the Holy Spirit working in both of their lives where they're saying, okay, this is not about me. I can't, it's not about me prove my point. It's not about them getting to see how bad they've been to me. It's about, Lord, Lord God, we want to bring you honor and glory. And the Holy Spirit begins to work, sometimes slowly, as they think about each other, as they focus on each other's needs. Again, it is easier to act yourself into a feeling than to feel yourself uh, feel uh, yourself into an action. So these steps that you're asked to take, you may not feel like them. I don't love the person anymore. Yes, you don't love the person anymore, but as you can still choose to focus on each other. There is hope for relationships, but it's a matter of maturity. If you're just going to stay, you know, it's my needs and selfish or stubborn, my pride, you're not going to move. You've got to say, Lord, I'm bringing you in this conflict. Help me. Now, just a moment to those of you that are divorced. Um, thank you for listening through all this, and it's tough. Um, God says, I hate divorce, right? How do we know that? He says in his word, I hate divorce. Why? Because he's the God of peace, not of division. Because he hates what divorce does to people. And if you're here in divorce, you could probably share it. Yeah, it does some things that are not good. To you that are divorced, please be reminded God forgives you and loves you. And you, we, those that are, of us that aren't divorced are no better. We're all sinners. But I'm speaking to those of you that are struggling in your marriage and you're thinking about packing it in. God can work in your marriage. There is hope for your marriage. And that hope is found in God. Uh, you may want to write this down. This is so true because social research bears this out. It's always more rewarding to resolve a conflict than it is to dissolve a relationship. It's always more rewarding to resolve a conflict than it is to dissolve a relationship. And there's people speaking um, that have been married and, and they will testify to that. And I've mentioned this before. We can run from a relationship, a place, a situation, but the problem is when we stop running, that's where we are. So if I'm insecure over here, I'll be insecure over here. If I'm stubborn over here, I'll be stubborn over here. If I'm proud and, and um, selfish over here, same thing over here. I've missed the opportunity for God to do a work in my heart, in my life. It's an opportunity to bring God glory. Now, if you're here, you're going to say, that's impossible. I can't do that. You're right. It is impossible, and you can't. I can't. It's only possible again, by drawing on the power and resources of God. That's why Paul says in the next verse, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So as you're in, uh, so in this case, your conflict, and as you're thinking about the other person, you're also ultimately thinking about Jesus. And then he goes on to say, who was in the highest place and went to the lowest place because he was focusing on 
your needs, your desires, because he loved you so much. He wanted to reestablish his relationship with you so that you would win. You'd have a relationship with him for all eternity. If you're a parent here this morning, I want to remind you of the distinction because it's, uh, there's a huge difference between fighting with your children and fighting for your children. With your children, there's going to be conflict. Bedtimes and chores and uh, all sorts of things. When you're fighting with your child, it's about you and your child. It's about maybe showing them that you're in control, that you know what's best, and you're the winner, your child is the loser. That's fighting with your child. Fighting for your child is where God is in the conflict, and you're not fighting to prove yourself. You're fighting for your child's heart so that their heart would ultimately uh, stay on Jesus. You want your child to win. That's why you're doing what you're doing. And it's this whole idea of God's love in you, and so you're able to work with your child from a loving heart. Don't fight with your children. Fight for your children. And you may just have to, outside of the heat of the moment, explain to your child, why are you doing these things? Because you want your child to follow Jesus more than anything else. Uh, back to, to, to um, marriage, I want to just take a moment now and share just a few ground rules that my wife Lisa and I, that we over the years have, have uh, come up um, with in our marriage because we are fighting for our relationship, reestablishing the re- relationship. Right? Because, okay, so let me just mention a few. Uh, speak the truth in love. We're both committed to that because, as you know, you can speak the truth, but you don't always speak it in love. Right? You, it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. And sometimes if, if there's something going on and we need to just kind of calm down a bit, we have to say a little time out and we'll, we'll discuss this at this certain time because we want to speak the truth in love. Sometimes that means a time out. Um, there are certain words that are off limits. Um, not just profanity, we're not using profanity, but certain words because those words push hot buttons. <coughs> Okay, if you're married, do you guys know the words, the hot buttons, right? I don't know about you and ours, but if one of us says to the other, you're just like your fill in the blank, right? That's like go directly to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200. That's not good. Um, We don't minimize or invalidate the other person's feelings. This is one I really had to learn my first few years of marriage because I would interrupt and tell my wife exactly why she shouldn't feel that way, because I've got six reasons for her, okay? Duct tape, listening, trying to understand where she's coming from. Uh, The threat of divorce, we've never once ever uttered that threat. It is off the table. And if it's on your table, you need to take it off the table because as long as it's on the table, it's not a safe discussion. It's not a safe place. That needs to go off the table. My wife and I, I don't know what lies ahead, but we're going to fight for our marriage until we die. That's just the reality. Uh, another one, we, we focus on the issue at hand rather than on who's to blame. We're not focused on, well, you and it's, what's the issue? Why are we not in agreement here, what's going on, and uh, so we stay focused on the the issue at hand, and we're not historical either, we don't bring up other issues, we're focused on this issue, because what can happen is there's a past issue, and and, you know, you forgave someone, sorry, the person asked for forgiveness, and and you said, I forgive you, but you took what was done wrong, or was said, and you just kind of tucked it in your pocket, just so the next time you had a disagreement, you could pull it out, and there it is. We don't do that, okay? We stick to the issue at hand. And just something I had to learn, again, I wish... Um, we had, by the way, so anyway, um, something I had to learn when I was younger uh, as well is I used to think that um, with every issue, we always had to resolve who was right and who was wrong, right? Anybody else? Like, there's times where... Um, 
we'd both agree, I'm, I was right. I love those times, right? <laughs> There's times when she's right. I don't like those times. But this is the eye opener. There's times when we can't agree on who was right. But even though we can't agree on who was right, that's not our focus. Our focus is on reestablishing the relationship. So we forgive each other and we move on, right? Focusing on the relationship with the same mindset as Jesus Christ. What's that person's needs? How can I bring glory to God? Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. In a world where we look around us, there's lots of conflict, and everybody is doing it their own way. They're either attacking, they're either escaping, they're aggressive, they're passive. In the midst of that, God is calling you to work for peace. So I want to challenge you this morning to think about, first, are you bringing God into your unresolved conflict? If you have a strained relationship, have you brought God in? Secondly, have you owned your part? Have you thought, God, I have done everything possible. As far as it depends on me, I've tried to live at peace. But if you haven't, you're stuck right there. You need strength to move through that fear. And that comes from getting along with God, getting confident with God in his love, and going to that person. May Woodside be filled with people who breathe grace. They breathe grace in their marriages. If they're married, they breathe grace in their friendships, in their schools, in their church, in their workplace for his glory. I'm going to invite you to bow your head with me as we pray. This morning, maybe it has been even decades where you have a strained or broken relationship and you have never taken ownership and said, God, I want to do it your way. I'm going to try it your way. Today is your day to make that commitment to God. And yes, it's scary, but God always honors faith. Will you this morning say, I'm going to do something, Lord, and I'm going to look to you. And it may be involving some other people or another person in the process, but I'm going to do something God's favor is on the peacemaker. Take a moment and talk to God this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you that when we were at conflict with you, you were the one that took the initiative to send your son Jesus. You were the one that looked at our need and you sacrificed for us. And Lord, I pray for all of those here this morning that call themselves Christians, your children. I'm praying, Lord God, that you'd work in their hearts and in the same way they would take the initiative to resolve conflict. Lord, for the person right now that's scared and doesn't want to do it, Lord, I'm asking in the days ahead that you would so give them a sense of your presence and love that they would take the next step, whatever it might be. And Lord, for the person that's not yet a follower of your son, Jesus, I lift him or her up to you this morning, and I ask, Lord God, that you would...